I don't know about you, but I find it really hard to believe in these big geopolitical narratives that we're being told that's peddled by journalists, publishers that are backed by very elite, very wealthy and untouchable forces that want to design the world in their image. But when you actually travel to those countries and you get to meet the people that are on the ground, the everyday people, the 99% of us, you find a different story, a different narrative, a story about life and about love and surviving and making do with what you have. Well, I had the real pleasure today of meeting up and talking with Yasmin Mede. She is a fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. She's an Iranian exile who ended up doing her studies at Manchester University in Edinburgh. And she is an editor of the journal Critique, the journal of socialist theory. She's really interesting because you actually get to meet and hear her story and understand what she's about, what she's trying to do in terms of advocating a different narrative. My guest has appeared on the BBC. She's published widely. She's a leading intellectual voice, especially when it comes to issues about the Middle East. She's part of an organization called Hope, meaning Hands Off the People of Iran, which advocates for a peaceful Middle East. So join with me. Hi, Yasmin. How are you doing? Not too bad. Glad that 2020 is over. Aren't we all? My gosh, what a year that was. <laughs> Hopefully we can do away with it. But, you know, it does bring up the question, do you think, like others who are on the left, that the pandemic really exposed what was already vulnerable, structural, issues in both the economy and in science and in you know all across the all across the gambit of how we live our lives absolutely uh, for a start we should have uh, been able to be more prepared for a pandemic apparently scientists have threatened had told the authorities this would be possible this was likely uh, my understanding is that in 2016 the british government went through a uh, trial, um, but then dismissed it um, on the hunt because they thought this was so unlikely. There was no reason for them to spend much time, effort about it. But also it exposed the inequalities. I mean, the inequalities have become a lot worse as a result of the pandemic, but it also exposed that despite what everyone says, it depends what kind of job you have, what kind of contract your job is, what kind of pay scale you're in, as to how, for a start, you survive this uh, pandemic uh, uh, in terms of your health even, but also then you survive this economically. The immediate, um, if you like, um, after effect of the first lockdown was how those who have, um, who are, um, if you like, um, mental uh, work is their their income is through mental work they uh, can work from home and those whose job we all depend on um, those not just in the health service but in terms of supermarkets uh, in terms of cleaning our streets cleaning our hospitals the very essential workers are the ones who a have to go out but b put their lives at risk because of those of us who benefit from a different type of job. So it enhanced that class divide, that uh, inequality. And of course, financially, it's been a disaster for a whole category of people in the hospitality industry, in all sorts of arts and entertainment industries. Uh, the list is endless. Yeah, and I, you're right about the most vulnerable being uh, those who are most at risk and who are suffering the most. And at the same time, those are on the, who are on the top end of the economy, uh, such as Bezos, you know, the Amazon, the, uh, the Apple, you know, those are the ones who are tripling, quadrupling their incomes throughout the pandemic in, in a way that 
it's like something that we all should share equally in combating the pandemic. It turns out that it exacerbated the capitalist structure that it, that's based on class differences and inequalities. Exer you know, really pushing those inequalities. The, the, the actually the pandemic actually exacerbates and pushes out both sides. The the few who have all and the many who have nothing continue uh, to have nothing, and that, that's just devastating to uh, to us as human beings trying to work against the privatization of public assets and so on. But I wonder if you could tell us a bit about your research that you're doing at Oxford. And then also, how did you end up at Oxford in the first place? Okay, so I have two uh, separate roles. <laughs> My job in Oxford is related to research computing, advanced research computing, which is basically high performance computing, which is a job that I've done for most of my life in different forms in different uh, universities, um, in Glasgow, in Strathclyde for a short time, universities, and um, uh, eventually in Oxford. So that's my, if you like, paid job. My <laughs> uh, association with Oxford is because of that. But I've also been lucky enough to be a CR member at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. And that's where the Middle East Center is situated. And of course, I have always written and um, spoken about Iran. And um, the Middle East Center is an excellent place to hear discussions about uh, various aspects of the Middle East, some of which I didn't know, but Iran isn't an isolated country. It's surrounded by the whole region, and the region influences everything that goes on in Iran. And of course, Iran tries to open what's going on in the region. But it has given me an unbelievable opportunity to understand the complexities and the history of the region. And, uh, and you are an exile from Iran, is that right? Okay, so I didn't have to, if you like, become a refugee because I was already um, married and settled in the UK when I, at the time when I couldn't go back. But um, yes, I am from Iran and I couldn't go back to Iran and escape. It, this is partly because of the... Um, uh, various political activities that I did, but in particular about uh, my return to Kurdish areas in Iran in the early 1980s, when I was um, um, a member, and at first a supporter, then a member of a left-wing organization, and that organization was uh, using uh, Kurdistan as its main base once it couldn't exist in the rest of Iran. So I was working on the radio station, both for technical, mainly for technical reasons, but I also was politically active with the organization. The organization was uh, um, the Organization of Iranian People's Fedai Guerrillas, that was the name pre Shah. And we, at the time I was in it, it was still that. It was the minority of what split in 1980 uh, from that organization. What do you miss the most about your country? Do you, do you, first of all, miss the culture, the Persian food? What do you miss the most about uh, being in exile, being a refugee? I suppose my family, most of my relatives live still in Iran. Uh, some do occasionally come abroad, but they live in Iran. And of course, I think most of us consider our roots as, as the people closest to us. I'm not too bothered about um, food, but I think I do miss the, the uh, buzz of a city like Tehran, which, is, uh, which was, from my childhood memories, a very uh, lively city. And whatever I see from films, from videos that people show, it remains not a beautiful city, but it's in a very beautiful setting with the mountains north of Tehran. And I think I do miss the mountains north of Tehran. The city is dominated by the mountain range, so you can't go anywhere without seeing the mountains. And it's very different in Oxfordshire, uh, where 
there are not like mountains around. Yeah. And, uh, and do you find yourself reading, keeping up on the news in Iran? Uh, and how do you do that? And do you also read fiction um, from Iran, Iranian writers? Um, or how do you get your information? And how do you understand uh, what's going on in the country? I follow both social media, but also the main papers in Iran, not all of them, but at least headline, at headline level. I also follow, um, if you like, the, the more reliable uh, in Persian language outlets inside, uh, outside Iran. The reason is there are some very unreliable ones paid by Queen Salman's relatives, not himself, or by the Israeli government. And they are just what I would call fake news at its worst. I mean, they are just uh, uh, the level is so low, uh, but also the information is false most of the time. So I just ignore them. I occasionally come across them because social media um, uh, reports the <laughs> banalities, but also the rubbish they've been saying. So I I only come across that through that aspect of basically people criticizing uh, those um, outlets. But I do follow um, first journalists who write from inside Iran, um, but also um, journalists who are being forced to exile, but, but have very good connections with um, newspapers inside Iran. Wow. And has, um, were you around in 1979 during the the revolution? Okay, I was at school in the UK. So my first uh, uh, connection with 1979 is uh, a few months after, but, but when I was, uh, when I went, when my parents allowed me to go back because I couldn't go back before that. But yes, I, um, I went, um, I remember the, the first anti-government demonstrations of 1979, post-revolution. And of course, I followed the revolution while I was in Britain um, when it happened. I was following everything that was happening. Um, I must admit, I had no sympathy with the religious establishment. So it is not something that um, um, I was very concerned that they would come to power and they did come to power. Um, I think I wasn't then a supporter of Ferdinand, uh, but I followed what they were doing and I followed other smaller, larger left-wing groups inside Iran. And I knew that uh, quite a lot of people only came out of prison weeks before February 79, so we couldn't expect much from the left, but, uh, uh, the, my first impression when I went to Iran was I went to a um, um, uh, protest by workers in South Tehran. Um, I went with friends. And when we came out of that meeting, it was a rally type of thing. We supported the continued strike. Uh, we couldn't walk. We had to be protected by um, groups of people standing on both sides of the exit uh, to stop Hezbollah attacking us. And um, that was, you could already see that repression was on its way. Do you, I understand that in Iran, it, it used to be very rich in democratic uh, politics, uh, culture, the arts, philosophy, um, in terms of just free expression. And do you, do you imagine an Iran in the future that would return back to that more secular, democratic, free speech environment? Okay, I have to qualify um, peer, best in terms of the two periods we're talking about, but also qualify what we mean by freedom uh, of expression. Um, I would say that under the Shah, there was um, freedom for individual rights in terms of what you wore, what you did, what, um, 
music you listen to and so on. And those freedoms don't exist, or at least aren't legal. They exist because people flout the rules, but they're not legal under the Islamic Republic in terms of what you drink, for example, or what you eat. However, I think once you descended from um, the politics of the trance era, you were on the threat. Writers were arrested, um, uh, poets who were really not saying anything radical were arrested, they were put in prison. So freedom of expression didn't exist under the Shah in the full extent of the world. I think with the Islamic Republic, there is a lot of restrictions. Writers Association members are arrested for translating the books that the regime didn't like. I, I really, you can't really uh, say more than that. Uh, but at the other hand, it doesn't mean that people have stopped reading or stopped thinking. Iran remains one of the countries where uh, books are very important. I think people read whatever they can. The censorship is often very selective. So for example, the works of Marx are translated and available. But if you read anything that is uh, seriously critical of the Islamic Republic, you won't find it in the open um, bookshops. You can find it, but you would need to search for it and find it and read it in hiding. So there is that level of um, if you like secret lives of people and their open life. And this is also true of individual freedom. But here, both during the Shah and during this regime, class plays an important role. So I did say that under the Shah's regime, you could wear what you want, you could um, drink what you want and so on, but it also depended what kind of income you had. So if you were from a poor family, you were very likely to be wearing a headscarf or a chadra because your family expected you to do that, but also your income didn't allow you to be part of the fashionistas of North Tehran. So that divide was very clear. Um, yeah. And of course, you could drink or eat anything you want, but you had to afford to be able to afford it. And this, in a way, the same is true now. So if you're rich, you flout the rules, you, you don't care about the rules, you pay the bribes. So the revolutionary guards come and you know, stop your family gathering, your party, whatever, and you bribe them and you can do what you want. Uh, but uh, legally, you shouldn't be drinking. So that's the. Uh, and how did you become an, an activist, a spokeswoman for uh, progressive equality, uh, human rights, maybe? How did you end up becoming? that person? Did, were you raised in a family that was sensitive to human empathy and, and human common, our commonalities? Or did, was that something that you discovered on your own? Um, I was born in a very political family in that the family discussions were always about politics. Um, I rarely had news without people talking about politics. But my family were very right wing in general, and they supported the coup against uh, the Mossadegh, the Shah's coup d'état in 1953. And although they were very critical of the Pahlavi dynasty because they were criticizing corruption, they were criticizing um, all sorts of, if you like, the, the the lack of understanding of ordinary people by the court, so to speak. Uh, and at times they were even um, dismissing the uh, Pahlavi dynasty from uh, the and even more right wing views than the Pahlavi. But um, at least it made me aware of what people criticized the Shah for, uh, uh, from very bizarre points of view, not something that I adhere to. I think one of the reasons I became uh, politically active quite young, even before going to school in the UK, was that um, um, probably around the age of 12 or 13, I, we visited North Tehran 
uh, during the, one of the religious festivities. We were on holiday there, so we were uh, staying in a villa, we were there on holiday. And the ordinary people were on the streets of this town flagellating themselves for the death of Imam Hussein. And uh, they looked different from people I knew, they were dressed differently, and they behaved differently. And they were obviously, for them, religion wasn't just, it wasn't just religion, it was their escape from the poverty, the um, yeah. life they had. And I suddenly realized that the life I had led until then was so artificial that I didn't know anything about my own country, that the school I went, which was a French school in Tehran, where most privileged young kids went to, had no, um, re no association with reality. The reality was that scene. And I think there were a number of events like that. I won't bore you with all of them, but there were a number of events that made me conscious of those class differences. Um, and then I heard from schoolmates how um, people who opposed the Shah had been put into prison. Uh, we were already at that age even in kind of thinking about why are these people called terrorists and that kind of, you know, general um, school activities that uh, became, uh, even in my school, which was unusual for that school, but at least a group of us felt there was something wrong with what was going on. I think that influenced me later. I never moved from that position. And at the same time, you were also trained in computers, in advanced, uh, maybe coding. What, what, how did you end up getting trained at that French school? Was that a, where you started learning okay. computers? Okay, I, uh, I didn't like social sciences under the Shah, because social sciences under the Shah was he had written a book called The White Revolution, and it's the most boring book you could ever imagine. And this was supposedly our kind of social science book. We actually had to pass exams on it. Fortunately, I left before the year where you had to pass exam. But social sciences were dire. I, I, they are now as well. Now they're influenced by apparently religion and all sorts of things. But social sciences were dire in those times. So. I concentrated in mathematics and physics. And when I moved to Britain, I couldn't speak English. I, my French was good, but I couldn't speak English. So I ended up uh, concentrating in maths and physics because it was easy. You didn't need the language skills to do that. And what happened then was that I did electrical engineering and electronics at the University of Manchester. And I followed that by um, physics in St. Andrews University. So that's how, and, and I, although at, on many occasions politics has dominated my life, I never gave up on that, partly because it's how I live, how I earn my living, but also uh, because I think it grounds me to a better situation. I, I wouldn't have done well, if, it, if politics was like the only aspect of my life, I think. And nowadays, you find yourself at Oxford. How long have you been? In, it's five years now. Five years. Okay, wow. I remember attending Oxford as an undergrad, and it was a pretty sensational place to be. And But to, in returning back there, because uh, I gave a lecture there a year or so ago, and it's just been ratcheted up. Uh, in terms of like really high end, very, I don't know, it's, it seems like a city that's less about scholarship and more about bling or conspicuosity. But in any case, I hope you're enjoying Oxford. There are aspects of that, but I think, I think that's part of what higher education has become in many ways. At least there is a bit of resistance to it in Oxford which doesn't exist in some places, but that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. And what do you, what do you make of, um, well, first, let me ask you a question about uh, being a woman. Do you think it was harder as a woman um, going through 
that transformation from your more right side family, your family that is more traditional and, and leaning to the right uh, and conservative. Um, as a woman, was it di more difficult, do you think, to become more politically conscious and eventually uh, start to implement events and programs that, that challenge the status quo? Mm -hmm. I think my family would have been happier if I had concentrated on, uh, on the science and engineering part. They were both disappointed, but also very concerned for my safety once I became politically active. And it wasn't easy, I, I'm pretty sure, but I made life very difficult for, for them. Um, but on the other hand, I must admit that I was lucky enough to be born in a family that didn't interfere in my life. So I had the freedom to um, do the job I wanted to do and get, and, uh, and, I, and they were aware of my politics. They were very upset about it, but they tolerated it. Uh, I think the difficulty is more with, if you like, acquaintances and people you know. And for them, um, it was quite a shock. Um, left wing politics was for their enemies, not their friends or acquaintances. And I think for them, that was um, they, I, I did not continue relations with those acquaintances negatively. And um, I think nowadays it has come to a situation where uh, they might. Um, uh, concede that they know my family, but they would deny knowing me, which is fair enough. And that's how it goes. And how would you describe, based on the life you've lived, it's pretty extraordinary, how would you describe the basic differences between, say, right-wing conservatism and, uh, let's say, more socialism or left-wing uh, position. What, what are the defining factors of a progressive left-wing position for you? I think that if I start with the conservative view, the conservative view is that um, the, uh, those who have money, those who have inherited money, um, ha have a right to it. And as a result of this right, they justify exploiting others, they justify owning land, for example, and having peasants, even in the 21st century, tenants, they might call it something different, but uh, uh, even in the 21st century, benefiting from the work of others to which they have put no, they have made no contribution. And that is the, and, and the, and the, constant concern that the wealth they already have might diminish, not disappear, but diminish slightly, even, even slightly. So we are facing people who constantly worry about uh, what they have and how they want more of it and, and so on. And I think people who are socialists do realize that um, they are even if they have, if they can benefit from income from their mental work, from their social work, whatever, their work in the health service or whatever, they realize that they are very privileged, that uh, uh, the majority of the population are exploited even further than they are exploited, uh, that there is no inequality, there is no equality, that the gap between the rich and the poor is not just bad for the poor who are more than 95-97% of the population, some say 99% of the population, but it's that in the long term is bad for everybody, including the one percent. And I think yeah, that's distinguishing. Even in capitalism, so-called the theoretical version of it, where it's predicated on comp competition. Well, once you have monopolies, which is precisely the tendency of capitalism, then you nullify any kind of competitive possibility, in which case you get better products, better innovations, and so on. 
So at a certain point, it contradicts itself. Now we're familiar with this position, of course, but, and, and so what are you doing now to, in these days to um, organize, to, are, are you focused on uh, educating, uh, opening up consciousness, or are you focused on direct action? How do you, uh, and with your organization, Hoppy, is it called? Uh, could you explain what that is and what it tries to do? Okay, so um, Hopi stands for Hands of People of Iran, and it's an anti-war group, basically, but it's an anti-war group that refuses to say, okay, we are against the US, therefore we must support Iran's Islamic Republic. I've already explained why I think you can't support Iran's Islamic Republic. Um, we educate, I think most of our work, we used to have demonstrations of small or larger meetings, annual conferences, but of course in the last 12 months that's been impossible, the last 10 months. So we do have sessions, we organize meetings, we give interviews, we give uh, talks, not just about uh, the threat of war, which still exists, Believe it or not, um, in the last days of the Trump administration, there is still an expectation that he will do something to make sure there is no peace between Iran and anywhere, any other country. And um, that, that sanctions continue, that there isn't a return to the nuclear negotiations and so on. So we have campaigned about that. Um, this has involved campaigning, not just against um, what Trump and uh, Pompeo have been saying, but also the myriad of uh, Iranian opposition groups they are paying. So they have uh, um, set up funds. Uh, one of them was actually called Iran Misinformation Center. And I don't know if you heard, but somewhere in the middle of 2019, even Trump decided that was a bit too much. So their funds were reduced, but this doesn't mean they don't agree. So we have this constant battle of trying to argue against the comments made by these people, comments that are completely false. And uh, in order to justify what I can only see to be uh, US intervention in Iraq, now, US intervention in Iran is not for democracy, is not for human rights. US intervention in Iran, if it happened under Trump or if it happens under Biden or at any time in the near future, is exactly what was intervention in Iraq or in Syria or anywhere else. It's destructive. And ordinary people in Iran, my relatives who are quite right wing, who find nature should be pro-regime change and the return of the Shah or somebody right wing like him. Um, even they uh, don't approve of this type of regime change. And the reason is that people look at the countries around themselves and see the disaster that's Iraq. They see that what's um, 17, 18 years nearly after, 17 and a half years after the invasion, the situation is worse, there isn't more democracy, there isn't more human rights and so on. They look at Afghanistan, there is no constructive, it's bombing every day. So we try and draw attention to this as a day, almost a daily campaign, because you have groups that are paid by you know, these um, organizations, but you also have individuals who in the despair of exile, which I can sympathize, you know, people have been in exile for a long time, there isn't any sign of the Iranian government going and so on, have become paid members of these uh, lobby groups. So you have former journalists, you have lawyers, human rights lawyers, you have, who are all part of what I would call the Trump bin Laden, bin, sorry, Trump bin Salman, Netanyahu, uh, uh, clique. Yeah. And they are the people who are uh, daily appearing to tell us why it would be great if the US uh, increased sanctions. <laughs> Ordinary people in Iran are dying of hunger, aren't getting food, aren't getting medication, and these people are telling us 
campaigning for more sanctions. I speak to a lot of people inside Iran, many of them left-wing activists, some of them noble activists. They are all united that the economic situation is terrible. And it's not just about sanctions. It's also mismanagement. It's also corruption. But they say until sanctions are removed, you can't deal with the other issues. So you do need to have the sanctions removed. It's a kind of basic fact. So we campaign about this. We have meetings, we have discussions. Um, I'm at times invited by BBC Persian to make commentary about the situation. If I am, I try and put forward an alternative view to the view that is almost uh, the standard view of the exile um, community, if you like, that anything is better than the Islamic Republic. I want the overthrow of the Islamic Republic, but I don't want Iran to become um, a divided, multi-war um, um, situation where civil wars will go on for another decade. Wow, thank you for that. And, you know, the for those of us, many people don't understand some of the details in Iran and they, the very simple picture you get by, say, the media in the West is, Iran's trying their hardest to build a bomb, to drop it on Israel or to drop it on the US somehow. Um, and I wonder, is that accurate? Or if you could nuance that for us, that would be really helpful. Okay, so the Iranian government has ambitions in the region, but do you think a nuclear weapon would not achieve that. As you know, if Iran used a nuclear weapon in Israel, Iran would go as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, um, and I, I don't know, but from what I've read from others who have followed the program, Iran is trying to get to a stage where it can build nuclear weapons, but hasn't gone that far yet. And many countries do the same. It's, if you like, their insurance policy. Um, I think in terms of Iran's animosity with Israel, it's more a, a situation of despair. Iran has nothing left from, the Iranian government has nothing left from the revolutionary era that brought it to power. It, the, that revolution was about social equality, freedom, um, at least reducing the gap between the rich and the poor and independence. Yeah? So there's nothing left of, I don't think anyone in the Iranian government would be stupid enough to claim there's more democracy now than under the Shah. As I said, there is less. It's obvious. There's more political prisoners, there's more execution of political opponents. You can't say there is um, uh, uh, um, less, more equality, the gap between the rich and the poor has increased. And here, I take you back to your own point, you are right that we are talking about a situation where the, in the world the gap has risen, but Iran has followed neoliberal economic policies and it has also followed the pattern and you have uh, sons of Ayatollahs living, uh, sons and daughters of Ayatollahs living a life of luxury while the ordinary people live in absolute abject poverty. People associated with the government benefit from sanctions because they are the owners of black markets. So they've made multi-billion dollar um, wealth and so on. So they can't have claims that either. The only thing that stays is this claim of independence. And I would, um, I would say you have to be very careful about this because in many ways, Iran would love to become more friendly with the United States. Right? It has shown its willingness on a number of crucial occasions, immediately before the invasion of Afghanistan, immediately before the war in Iraq. It is the US that can't forgive Iran for various very good psychological reasons. 1979 revolution, the embassy speech, the events in Beirut, these are all, if you like, deeply ingrained in the mindset of 
both Democrats and Republicans in the US, but Republicans in particular. And therefore, there is, uh, you know, Iran tries to have better relations with the US, tries to give them information when it can about the joint enemy. It's the US that rebuts it. Israel is a different matter. Iran's claim in the region is that it is a defender of Palestinians. I've come across many Palestinians who tell me we wish this was true. Iran hasn't really done anything for Palestinians. But at least in rhetoric, it is standing against Israel, saying it doesn't it's opposed to the policies of the Zionist state. Will it ever use a bomb, a, a nuclear bomb against Israel? Unbelievable, um, impossible. It would just not be the case. No, but the argument is, of course, as you mentioned, you have that capacity and you have leverage to actually negotiate. And so it's a kind of, um, it's a really dire dilemma, a toxic dilemma, a very dangerous dilemma. And, and I, can, I can understand psychologically, if you are boxed into a corner, you're trying to get leverage. That's just the logic of, of relationships of, you know, so then you as a, you know, you, you, uh, you, with your organization, Hoppy, Hoppy, is that how you pronounce yeah, it? Hoppy, yeah. Yeah, Hoppy, uh, which emphasizes nonviolence. And so I, you know, I wonder from your perspective, if, you know, obviously, you know, people who are nonviolent, myself included, would say, well, we need to de-escalate the nuclear threat and eventually just get rid of it over, you know, have a plan. Now, would that ever happen? Not with, no, pr probably not pragmatically. Yet, of course, you try to lobby, you try to educate, uh, and hopefully, you know, you try to change the general consensus in the public. Um, so with your, so then the question becomes, and here, here it comes, as a, someone who speaks and argues and advocates for nonviolence, what's your position on the nuclear question? Okay, so hope we have stood for um, a nuclear free Middle East. That's what we say. We say we want a nuclear free Middle East. That includes the Israeli state's nuclear industry and nuclear weapons. The reason, um, and there, as you know, they don't say they they are uh, they don't say they have nuclear weapons. They don't deny they have it. This gray area that everyone is in, and uh, in fact, Rupi has benefited from the support of a number of um, Jewish-born anti-Zionist activists who have always helped us make um, such statements, such as Moshe Machaber and people like him. So our position is that uh, um, we want a nuclear free Middle East, and that includes Iran and Israel. Now, uh, I have a personal opinion, which isn't uh, um, his position, obviously. And I think that the nuclear industry for Iran has problems. One of the problems is lack of um, health and safety and the, the way, not just under the Islamic Republic, but when this industry started under the Shah, people have now written about the lack of um, like respect for radiation um, monitoring, uh, both in terms of individuals and places of work and so on. And I realized that uh, obviously the you know, Iranian nuclear industry hasn't had a major incident and so on. But uh, no one predicted Chernobyl, no one predicted sea scale when it happened in the UK and so on. And therefore, I would rather people didn't go that route. Um, there is another additional argument which I have to explain as well. Uh, this is because partly because the stupid right wing Iranian opposition keeps going on about it that if Iran has so much oil and gas, why does it need nuclear industry? I believe the answer to that question is that uh, in terms of strategy, if you're looking at economic problems, it would be a better idea to, if you like, supply your internal use of power through the nuclear plants and use and sell oil and gas, if you're looking long term, 
Now, of course, pandemic has changed a lot of that. The price of oil is falling, all sorts of other things. But I think there are other arguments, and, and Iran is using its nuclear industry in medical uh, facilities and so on. But despite all of this, um, I know and I see how uh, workers report lack of health and safety in every aspect of uh, manufacturing, car manufacturing, industrial uh, developments in Iran. And I worry about the nuclear industry. Well, thank you. I, I want to thank you for taking the time to discuss your work uh, and your life experience with us, uh, with me. And thank you. I wonder, just as a way to finish, what do you like to do that brings you great joy or um, what hobbies do you, do you have outside of, say, your work? Um, not a lot, <laughs> partly because it, at the moment we're in two different types of things. Uh, I don't get a lot. But uh, I swim. I used to swim a lot and I still do. Um, and uh, if I can, I spend as much time as I can in the world. Well, thank you again, Yasmin. It's really a pleasure and I appreciate it.